Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Karen and I'm your B-Cyber host. B-Cyber is a cyber security firm based in Sydney, Australia, and we work with groups to review their cyber business risk and provide solutions, both proprietary and third party, to harden their current cyber resilience stance. Today, our speaker is Brett Williams from Flashpoint, one of our marquee business partners. They're a US firm specialising in risk intelligence and compromise potential monitoring. So they're very well placed to demystify the dark web. Before I introduce Brett, there are a few housekeeping matters. Firstly, the slide deck has been put together with the idea that you'll be able to use it as a resource. So there may be a number of slides that we just touch briefly on. Okay, so don't stress over that. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available in due course. And now it is with great pleasure that I introduce Brett. Brett is the lead solutions architect at Flashpoint and is responsible for explaining the value of risk-based intelligence across and within enterprises and how the monitoring of the deep and dark web should be an integral part of any threat intelligence program. He's responsible for providing intelligence services covering areas such as cyber threat intelligence, anti-fraud, physical security, counter-terrorism and law enforcement. He's widely recognised for his extensive and in-depth knowledge of the security landscape and with over 27 years experience working in technology and security with a focus on incident response, intelligence, security operations and digital forensics. Brett's well placed to help us demystify the deep and dark web. Welcome Brett. Thank you Karen. Good morning everybody. Good afternoon if you're yes. watching it after. <laughs> good, good point me out yeah. or good evening. Yeah. Um, so yeah. look before we get started Brett do you want to tell us a little bit more about Flashpoint? Sure. Um, so Flashpoint's a a cybersecurity or a threat intelligence vendor um, in the sense that what we do is we try and get into hard to reach places or try and collect data from uh, hard to reach places and track those threats in real time. And what I mean by that is it's essentially where threat actors, be them physical threat actors, cyber threat actors, banking fraud type threat actors, hang out, collaborate and work. And the reason we mainly reason we do this is to give sort of that forward visibility of, of potential threats, understanding what's um, being planned, what tools and techniques do these actors use, who are they targeting, etc. So from a business risk perspective, that sort of gives you that external lens into what's happening and allows you then to better plan, better protect yourself, better, you know, essentially get ready to um, uh, to, to defend against these threats. So predominantly we do that through various technologies and uh, analysts. We have an analyst team um, that essentially you know, use personas to get into um, these hard to reach places and to collect that data. We then provide that data uh, through various um, means, through portals, APIs, intelligence reports, uh, and many of the samples I'll be showing today in the presentation are direct from Flashpoint's um, platform. Cool. Thanks, Brett. So look, I think to help set the context for today's webinar, can you provide us with a little bit of, um, say, the history of e-crime e and maybe go through how cybercrime actually works? We hear about it, but how does it operate? Yeah, no problems. It's, it's an interesting um, word and it's been banded around quite a bit over the last few years. But if we look at, um, I want to sort of step back in time initially, because right? e-crime, cybercrime, whatever you want to call it, is nothing new. And I think the first thing is it's just crime. Right. As we know, if we look at anything in the world, uh, bad people will find uh, ways to exploit anything good. Right. Doesn't matter what it is, physical crime all the way to this cyber crime. But just a little bit of a brief history. And as I said, this is nothing new. Right. So back in 1834, there was a, a pair of thieves that hacked the French telegraph system, purely motivated to steal financial market information. So you could almost say that was essentially the first cyber attack in some respects, because they were using technology to steal information. You know, a couple of years after Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, there was a, a group of teenage boys, of course, um, who were attacking the telephone system in New York, but essentially repeatedly intentionally misdirecting and disconnecting customer calls. So it's sort of like a early hack as well. And then it, it sort of into the 50s, there was a, a young seven-year-old boy who was blind, but he had what was called perfect pitch. He could, you know, he could hear high pitched tones on the phone and anyone who's been around for long enough knows that the tone system on the phone is how you do long distance phone calls and there was lots of little noises are made, but he could, you know, whistle essentially at, at the same frequency, which was 2600 hertz, which enabled him to essentially communicate across those phone lines for free. 
right? So he went, he went on, on, on the persona of Joe Bubble. So we call that phone freaking. He was one of the first to do it, right? So that was in the 50s. And then sort of moving forward, you start to um, get more into the computer style, right? And so if you look at you know, viruses, they've been around for a while. You know, there was a, a University of Washington computer center that um, essentially had a, uh, what was called the rabbit virus, and it, it spread like rabbits as like a, a, one of our first worms that we saw. And of course, moving more into you know traditional hacking, you know people probably know or have heard of Kevin Mitnick, quite a well-known hacker back in the 70s, was really well regarded for you know attacking um, really hard to get to networks. Um, and then we started you know, motivation and finance as as finance moved more and more electronically. Um, you know we're looking at. Um, an insider threat back in the 70s, a teller who embezzled over $2 million US, right? And then more recently, we start to get into the, the traditional malware viruses. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Tor a bit later. You know, Tor was sort of came out in the early 2000s. And then more, you know, probably uh, sort of, to me, a turning point in my sort of cyber career was that 2010 mark. And that's where we started to see stuff really step up, you know, things what we now call nation state attacks, um, you know, mass breaches, Stuxnet was, was sort of a, a sort of first sort of cyber warfare type attack. Um, and then even more recently, and I think with given that technology is so um, pronounced in our lives, it's getting more and more attention. So if we'd sort of just have a quick step back and so well, who, who are these threat actors and what, and what motivates them? And like I mentioned earlier, anyone who's got bad intentions will use technology for that intention. So it doesn't really matter. You know, people will find a way of using the technology for bad. Um, but we sort of can group them into, you know, sort of some buckets, right? Nation states, this is essentially country to country. These are governments after governments. Nothing new, been going on for centuries. You know, everything from spying to espionage to, you know, geopolitical type um, attacks. Clearly, you've got competitors and um, other entities who may want to do damage to your business in, in general. Uh, there's the cyber criminals. And I put the cyber criminals sort of in the middle, not, not to, or in some respects deliberately, because they're probably the most pronounced, right, that we see in our market. And we'll sort of talk about that a bit later. Uh, hacktivists, the, you know, people who are looking to, you know, essentially have stand on some sort of platform to to voice their views. And of course, um, like anything, extremists or violent non-state actors, terrorism, are uh, also uh, threat actors we need to worry about because equally they use some of the tools and technologies that we're talking about today, right? And of course, motivations do vary. Most of the motivations or a good percentage of the motivations is all about money, just like everything. Um, so that's why cyber criminals, you know, generating lots of business and there's stats going around that uh, cyber crime is, is making more money than the drug cartel, right? And that's why we're now seeing the drug cartels and other formalized cyber criminals getting involved in this space. Uh, geopolitical, you know, this is something a big topic right now across the world, um, particularly between nations and tensions between, you know, the US and China, or Australia and China, or Iran, and India and Pakistan. And, you know, all these geopolitical um, landscapes also, um, are threats to our business at a, at a strategic sort of level. And I think one sort of myth that I wanted to sort of bust is that you know, what we're talking about here, when we mention the word hackers, you know, I'm, I'm technically a hacker. Anyone who plays with computers is a hacker. Anyone who works on a car is a hacker. Hackers is not a bad term. It gets overused by Hollywood and the media. As, you know, you're a hacker. We're, we're being hacked. Reality is they're not the, the Hollywood hackers that we see on TV. You know, there's, People aren't wearing the hoodies in dark basements with green screens and all the usual stuff we like to see in Hollywood. Reality is they're people, they're, they're criminals, they have motivation. You know, a lot of it's about revenue and keeping the cost down, so reuse. So a lot of times when we talk about defending against a lot of these attacks, it's, it's making their life harder, right? If we can put blockers up, make it harder for them to attack us, make it make our, our attack surface uh, harder to... Um, to attack, that that increases the cost, increases the risk to the threat actor. So they won't target you; they'll move on. Now, I don't like to use the term, uh, you know, you've got to be faster than the slowest person type scenario, but that's really what we're talking about when it comes to cyber. You know, is being able to defend yourself to make these jobs of the criminals harder. And just like any type of organised um, org organization, organized organization, <laughs> there's a structure and there's a hierarchy and then there's outsourcing and there's specialists. So we generally see in the cyber crime ecosystem, a structure that allows them to work anonymously, 
but also at scale, right? So you'll have people who are specialists in writing malware, specialists who are uh, at hosting malware or doing a DDoS attack or conducting credit card fraud or payment processing, money laundering, whatever that might be. But they all sort of work up in a hierarchy. So that way, you know, gone are the sort of the days of having one person who does all the attacks, you know, and there's some sort of kingpin hacker. A lot of it's outsourced, a lot of it's um, scaled and, and controlled in a, a more systematic way, right? So we see that quite often, particularly in the larger uh, threat acting groups that, um, that we track. And sort of a high level structure, like what we're really talking about here is an enterprise, right? An enterprise is all about delivering services and making money. So naturally we're gonna have providers. These are people who are providing um, software providing services, right? So, and these these services, uh, everything from um, what we call bulletproof hosting, so hosting sites that can't be taken down, they're out of jurisdiction of your government um, or law enforcement, um, they're, they're agile, you know, like we all talk about cloud and infrastructure as a service. Well, that's been embraced by everybody, including um, people who can use it for bad. Uh, it could be that malware, like if I wanted to, specifically target an organization or specifically target a type of uh, industry. I might go and find an off the shelf piece of malware or an exploit or something because I, I may not have the skills to write malware. Um, when we start talking about fraud and you know probably where most of the, a lot of this money is coming from, the credit card fraud, the online fraud, you know, how do I move that money? How do I cash that money out in a way that it's clean, right? Um, how do I process without being caught? Right. And a big sort of trend, and we'll talk some of this a, bit, a little bit later when we talk about some ransomware, there's a big X as a service, right? Like um, in our IT world, we talk about platform as a service, software as a service, infrastructure as a service. Well, in the illicit underground, there's ransomware as a service, malware as a service, DDoS as a service. I can literally go and purchase a service and use it on a daily, hourly, minutely basis without having to have any skill sets whatsoever. Ultimately, these get bit pushed into channels, right? Where do I go and collaborate or purchase or you know, work with these providers? Where do I find these services? And, and that covers a breadth of different technologies, which we'll go through, but essentially there's forums and forums are places where people can log into, you know, advertise services, chat about them, you know, essentially have a, a collaboration environment. There are formalized marketplaces places dedicated to credit cards, places dedicated to IT or hacking services, um, et cetera. So where I can go and buy drugs, guns, and, and everything else on the market. And they work no different to the marketplaces we're all familiar with in our daily lives uh, that we use to do online shopping today, right? That just happen to be selling other items. Um, more recently in the last few years, a big uptick in use of chat services. I think as the world progressively moves mobile, and particularly a lot of countries that don't have um, formalized internet structures, they tend to move more to a mobile platform. So chat services is a big place where a lot of these businesses uh, uh, occur. Uh, social, you know, uh, where social networks are, are very large in our communities nowadays. So of course, they're gonna be used for good and bad intent. And of course there's customers, right, or buyers. So who, who, who are out there buying these services? Um, you know, who needs to go and buy ransomware as a service? Who needs to be buying bulletproof hosting? Who, you know, and it varies, of course. Like we talked about some of them earlier, it's it's going to be a criminal gang. And, and it could be a physical criminal gang who wants to get rid of some money that they're doing in the physical world. So they, they launder it through an, um, an online process. Uh, people looking for malware. Uh, people looking to do a, a phishing campaign, right? I, I want to launch an attack against a competitor. Or I want to, you know, um, take out some sort of. I have some sort of political stand, or I have an ideological stand. I want to um, to use. So the, the buyers are very. It's pretty much game on for anybody um, that that wants it. Excellent. Well, not so excellent actually. All right. So we've got a good understanding now of um, you know the context and the e crime history and players. What is the virtual illicit underground? And, but why is it important to us as a business? Yeah, good good question, right? Like I think there's some myths that we need to dispel here. Everyone sort of you know, use the term, the deep, the dark web, you know, it sounds mysterious, it sounds, you know, um, hostile and what have you. And look, it is, right? There are aspects of the deep and dark web that are not pretty and they're not places that you necessarily want to go to. But in reality, 
we sort of prefer to sort of talk about what we call open and closed sources. So like I said earlier, the underground can be anywhere. It's whatever platform's working for that particular actor, that particular group at the time. So we've seen a lot of bad activity on, on, on social networks, that are what we call you know, public facing social networks, chat services, websites, um, but also a lot of what we call closed sources, places that are hard to get into. And when I define hard to get into, it's places where you need to have credibility, you need to have um, shown some history that you know what you're doing, maybe you've got to be invited in. So just like other serious crime that happens in the physical world, you know, there's a, there's a lack of trust, so you've got to build trust. And that's generally when we, when we say those closed sources, that's when we're really talking about that deep dark web type, the harder to reach places. And the reason they're important to get visibility into is ultimately where people believe they have trust and where things are being discussed in a private sense is generally where the real action happens because that's where um, the planning happens. It's where things are being sold, et cetera. And that includes chat services, right? There's a lot of private um, uh, chat services out there, you know, across all the different platforms where th this happens. But it's also important to know that, you know, the deep and dark web also includes your own network because me as a general public cannot get into a company down the road's network, right? As a, it's a closed, it's a private network. So anywhere that's hard, we call them a closed source, you know, because they're not easy to get into and you sort of got to know what you're doing. And then there's open sources. But reality is the illicit underground covers the breadth of both. So what we hear a lot of is, is the deep and dark web and how do we get there and what is Tor, right? The first thing to sort of note is that Tor is, in, in my book, is not bad, right? Tor is not a malicious piece of software. Um, is it something you probably want running on your corporate network? No. Do you want people using it? Probably not. But in reality, it's it was invented for good. It was invented by the US military or the US Navy to do secure communications, right? To, to enable secure communications in defense. Uh, it's also used in, in, in states that don't allow their citizens to have a free voice. Right. So it's similar, you know, being able to get out, access the Internet, access services. Um, and it's just a, a way of getting um, in, 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 into somewhere. Right. And, 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 and being able to access that. But, of course, it's well known to be used to hide sites that are designed, um, you know, for bad, right? So my example here is I've got a, a drug store, right? So if I want to go and buy drugs, I, I generally do that for the tour. So you download the tour browser. And the main the main difference here is you can't, it's very hard to find the addresses. They don't use what we're traditionally known as, you know, a HTTP address or a DNS entry with, uh, you know, www.company.com, right? They're generally long numbers with a dot .onion address. So you sort of got to know where to go to or how to find them. It's not as easy as just searching Google because this, this is what's not indexed. That's the other thing with the deep and dark web or closed sources. It's what's unindexable. What can I index and find easily? So... Tor is essentially a way of communicating over a, an encrypted channel. It bounces across different machines called relay nodes around the world, and it's really hard to pinpoint the original user. Now, having said that, you know, there's, there's, there is the ability to intercept um, Tor. You know, obviously, law enforcement can take over what's called entry and exit nodes and, and monitor the traffic. Um, there's always a game of cat and mouse, game of whack-a-mole, you know, like here's an example from a, a year or two ago where the Alpha Bay market was taken down by US law enforcement. Uh, and within days, if you know, hours, Empire market stood up. Now, if you look at the two, it's really hard to tell the difference, right? They're essentially exactly the same because it's you take down one and just like a, a weed in your garden, another one pops up. So if I go through some of the, those sort of services that we talked about earlier, right? Cybercrime as a service. Uh, this is everything from selling ransomware, DDoS and malware. This is just being able to get access to services that I may not have the skill sets to deliver myself. So as such, you know, here's some example prices. These are from uh, last year, but you know, the prices do vary, obviously, like any marketplace, go up and down based on demand. But these are just sort of, you can see just to do DDoS attack and hiring infrastructure to do a denial of service. And I guess for people who may not know what a denial of service attack is, it's essentially a way of flooding a website or a service that it, it's unusable to the normal customers, right? So you just, you send so many requests to the, say an e-commerce site that the normal customers cannot log on. So it's it's malicious in the sense that it can take a business offline, right? right? right. And you can, yes. 
Sorry, Karen? We've just got, sorry to interrupt. We've just got a question. We've got a question here. It says, are you seeing more cyber criminals showing up on open source to more easily spread their cells? Yes. Yeah, look, I think, yeah, uh, yeah, that's true, right? So there's, what we see is a shift. We see a shift in technology as either the demand changes or something gets taken down. And, uh, you know, Flashpoint does a lot around physical security and, and tracking um, uh, counterterrorism type activities. And we saw this recently with uh, Telegram. As Telegram gets taken down, those posts get moved somewhere else. Uh, we saw this with some other actors on 4chan and 8chan. As those sites get taken down, they move their business somewhere else. This happens in all, you know, all of it. Uh, the majority of these type of services are still sitting in the deep and dark web sort of forums and marketplaces because the infrastructure's there. It's well protected in, in that book. But yeah, 100%. Um, you know, there's Facebook. We've seen Facebook groups. We've seen, um, you know, or more recently, if you've been keeping up the press, there's there's uh, misinformation, geopolitical campaigns happening on TikTok, right, and other social. So it does, yeah, open sources then close is, is an open slabber. These are just some examples, I, you know, I've, I thought I'd pull out just from a, an example of what you can get as a service. So on the left-hand side, we've got what's called Lime Rat, uh, which is what we, you know, is a rat is a remote access tool. So it's essentially a piece of software that allows remote access. Uh, this is sort of a, a bundle, you know, a lot of these malware or these uh, services we see uh, have uh, modules that you can buy and turn on and off depending on what your mission is. So this one, you know, is a Bitcoin miner, a DDoS attacker, stealing of Bitcoin, obviously it's ransomware, etc. cetera. Um, and you can see these aren't that expensive. Uh, the, when this was taken, which was uh, back in June 15, um, we're talking $89 US, so roughly about $140, $130 Australian just to buy that, right? And uh, they, how many have they got in stock? So they work like that. Um, we see people advertising new ransomware all the time. You know, that top one there, the magician ransomware builder is a, essentially a way of building ransomware. Um, you know, this is actually from somebody who's newcomer to C programming and, and 40, you know, he or she would have a project of building some ransomware, right? Um, so you can easily go and buy that and download samples, etc. cetera. Uh, the bottom example there, the macro builder. A lot of us will be familiar with phishing emails that have attachments, you know, please open the invoice or here's your, uh, you know, your delivery docket, please open this. That's a lot of that is what we call weaponized Word or PowerPoint or um, Excel or PDF documentations, right? And they generally are uh, weaponized in the sense that if you open them up, they will do either ransomware deployment or something else. Very easy to sort of go and get off the shelf builders for that. I don't need to know anything about building custom macros for malicious purposes. I can just go through the next, next, next type scenario and drop in a malicious Word document and send it off in my phishing campaign. It's important to note that when these developers are creating this software, they also um, test it, right? They want to make sure that they get the biggest bang for the buck. We see prices vary, um, certainly based on how good the software is and how, you know, if it's been picked up by too many antivirus solutions or is it being blocked now or people know about it, that price varies. You know, it's a, it's a supply and demand uh, scenario. So they, they have their own internal testing. And I took a screenshot of one recently where they were testing a piece of malware and you can see green is all the antiviruses that will um, have no issues um, or won't detect it, right? So that happens. And it's, a, again, a game of cat and mouse. More interesting, um, we also see the uh, enterprise software being sold and traded. And there's a number of reasons for this. Obviously, there's just the usual piracy of people not wanting to pay the enterprise software prices for various things. But in this particular example, this was more around helping threat actors build an enterprise infrastructure for, you know, APT attacks or corporate espionage attacks. So if I'm going to attack a company, I'll profile them, understand what they use, what, how their network's structured. And for me to test my attack and for the, you know, to be able to you know, conduct it, I sort of need to test it in a lab, right? So I need to go and buy that enterprise software. This particular threat actor on a Russian forum was offering packages of enterprise software that I could easily purchase, um, deploy, and sort of start doing my own testing, right? So, um, and that's an interesting sort of trend because you've got to think about it. If I'm going to you know, build a campaign, I want to make sure it works. And, you know, you don't want to sort of do a live fire exercise because you'll get detected. So that's another sort of interesting trend we've seen in the last um, uh, few years. 
I mentioned before, you know, DDoS as a service, etc. So this is very much a, a big, a big uh, offering on the dark web where you can just simply go and, and grab different DDoSs. There's obviously software people can download for free, so you don't even have to buy a service. You know, running a DDoS attack at scale is is not a particularly complicated um, attack. Uh, more interesting is the is phishing. We all we've all survived or been hit by a phishing campaign, and how are they done? Well, obviously people buy and sell credentials and email addresses, but then they need the ability to bar to, to um, you know, build up infrastructure to, to deliver that, that phishing campaign. That's, that's a game of odds. The more I send out, the more, how likely am I going to get people to click on it, right? It's not necessarily a targeted uh, campaign unless we're talking about uh, specific phishing campaigns that are targeting individuals. And just like everything, um, what I find quite fascinating, particularly in the marketplace, is, is they run it like any other vendor would. You know, I work for a very you know, defined space in, in, in cybersecurity. I do demos every day. I talk to customers about their business problems. You know, we help them through a sales cycle to get to a solution. This doesn't mean, you know, this is the exact same thing that the threat actors do. So uh, this is an example actor that has a number of videos on YouTube to prove that his software does what it does and the types of DDoS attacks he's done, he'll he'll just deliver uh, demo videos, right, to prove. Many of these actors or well, these uh, marketplaces have support desks, SLAs, refund policies. You know, if I go and buy something and it doesn't work, there's a, a, a no questions asked refund policy because it goes back to the simple premise of trust. Trust and reputation is incredibly important, you know, and, and we've seen threat actors call other actors out as untrustworthy, right, because they're, you know, they're, they're either junior or they're, they're screwing customers over, pardon my French, but essentially that's how these guys work. It's all about trust and proof. Now, another uh, ongoing trend we see is obviously identity and identity theft and just the usual um, yeah, documents for sale. So here's some example prices. Again, these vary based on what's going on. Um, I haven't actually looked. It'd be interesting exercise to look and see if what's happening with passport prices at the moment, given the current pandemic and lack of travel and some countries not having visas anymore. But you can see it's not super expensive to get passports or, or driver's license or any other type of identity document. They're quite um, not relatively inexpensive. I grabbed some samples out of our collections on you know, related to Australia. You know, so these are just some recent ones um, from late last year, well, um, around sort of some passports and driver's license and Medicare cards. Now you can imagine um, even some of the, these two examples actually shipping from Australia. So that would indicate that the marketplace or the person running this particular marketplace is located here in Australia. Um, which is not unusual, right? Because it's easy to get identity documents in the country where you live. Uh, and you can imagine where these come from. They're everything from stolen, you know, lost uh, to forged. Um, and then they're, they're pushed out for the usual means of uh, you know, everything from opening a bank account to uh, you know, traveling illegally, et cetera. So uh, identity, as we know, is an important aspect. So we all should be protecting it the best we can. Another another trend we see is the RDP and network access as a service. Um, this is where there's a number of different sort of variances. There's the first variant of I can go and buy an RDP or a remote desktop server somewhere or VPS or virtual um, uh, network, uh, virtual server, and use that to launch my attacks. You know, we, we see quite often the whole... Um, did this attack from company A, country A or company country B? Uh, it's really hard to do that attribution because I could easily launch an attack against an Australian company from China, from some from Russia, from Hawaii. It doesn't matter, right? Because you can host these virtual services anywhere in the world and launch your attack. So that's one aspect, and that's some of the prices here where you can buy um, these services. Uh, so rather than you know use your home computer in you know in in, in um, in quotations, but you can host them somewhere. But the more disturbing one that we're starting to see <clears throat> and more you know, recently is the actual selling of access, right? So if I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I don't have to know how to write malware. I don't have to know how to do an attack. If I just want to go and target a company or I want to get access to a bank or I want to get access to an energy sector, I can go to marketplaces and buy them. Um, and they're already, they're already accessed. So one that's quite... Uh, popular recently, certainly you know, early part of 2020, was a uh, Magbu, um, 
and this is you know being talked about quite extensively in the press. But you can sort of see the prices we're talking about here. Here's an example from that, just from uh, early June, web shell access. You know, it's a backdoor into a website, has uh, SQL database on it. Um, you know, it's got a number of different, this is clearly, uh, this looks like it's in uh, Vietnam, um, you know, a, an online portal or an online commerce site, right? It's $4, right? So not, uh, it's $4 US equivalent. So, um, Another another idea that we're or another idea another uh, trend we're seeing is the concept of RDP as a service or access for sale, like I mentioned. So, here's are some recent examples of where um, threat actors have access to Citrix and Citrix service and RDP service through the Citrix protocol, uh, and they literally just advertise on here's what I've got, here's um, how much they're worth. You know, they, they sometimes they work in auctions, sometimes they work on di uh, direct negotiations. So you can see that. Um, uh, you know, those sort of prices and, and, and the type of, they, they generally will not advertise. The trend we see is it's, a lot of times they will not advertise the name of the entity. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, obviously there's companies like ourselves and law enforcement who are monitoring these places. And it's a, a good early indicator. If we get a name of a company, we can do something about it. Um, so you'll generally see things like it's a $1 billion Australian business. This is the amount of revenue. Um, and, and through investigations, we can sometimes work out who that is. Uh, or you get something similar to the, the post below from early in June where we, um, where a particular software vendor was, um, uh, had their, their software breached or network breached and you know, had a list of all the customers and, and et cetera. So again, if I was looking for access into the you know, JP Morgan or Intel or Amazon or Google who uses the software, I could easily go and purchase that online and, and, and launch my, um, my attack quite easily. Another marketplace that gets quite a bit of attention um, is called Genesis. Now, to sort of set the scene here is a lot of the websites or e-commerce sites you go to, online banking, you know, online shopping, uh, anywhere where money may be tra uh, transacting online have anti-fraud solutions inbuilt, right? They, they look to go, they know who you are, the type of computer you use, the type of browser, the time of day, your location, the language, the screen resolution, how you move your mouse. There's a lot of aspects they use. And the reason they do that is they want to make sure it's you. If you're logging onto your online banking or you're logging onto your, your e-commerce site, that it's it's really you and you're being, you know, they can tell it's you as opposed to someone remote. So Genesis was essentially formed to sell what we call fingerprints. So that's taking a fingerprint of the computer, like basically an image of the computer, and that's things like your cookies, your saved passwords, um, your browser, everything aspect on your computer, and providing that in a package that can be bought by fraudsters or threat actors to, to impersonate that computer. So again, if I wanted to target a particular entity or I was looking to target you know, a particular group of uh, websites, I could go to the Genesis marketplace, I can go find that um, website, see if there's any, how many are available to be purchased and purchase them. And some of these are as little as one or two dollars because they might only have 10, 15 credentials up to a couple of hundred dollars because they've got lots of credentials and lots of data, right? So this is a way of essentially impersonating someone's computer because as we get better as defenders detecting fraud, the bad guys need to find ways of getting around that. Uh, and then more recently, uh, uh, Google actually did a really good job of plugging the Genesis Marketplace's um, uh, plugins um, on one of the Chrome updates, Chrome 80, and it essentially sent, sent them into a tailspin because the plugins no longer worked for the bad guys. But literally within a few hours, if not a day, things were updated, things moved on, and everything was back up and running again because you can only, you know, the game of game of cat and mouse, like I keep saying. So this is a very interesting trend, um, very easy to go find. Um, you know, data um, based on that. And, and we track that quite extensively. And of course, one of the, probably the biggest biggest trends we see is um, banking, right? And the use of uh, monetization, right? Or stealing of bank accounts. So this is everything from credit cards to full bank accounts to, uh, you know, logins to multiple bank accounts, et cetera. And you can see these vary again, based on the type um, that we have, right? Um, And 
another thing we see in the, in the online banking space is the how-to. Now, going back to my sort of concept before about the, um, uh, you know, the, the threat actors learning around how to get around fraud detection, they also want to share how-to documents. And here's some recent ones that I, you know, I've been sort of tracking. And uh, the one on the left is, you know, if anyone's familiar with PayID, it's a you know, you know, payment um, technology, transfer technology we use here in Australia. Uh, there's uh, how-to documents just recently updated on how to bypass that, how to use it, et cetera. And these, again, marketplaces you can go to and, um, you know, essentially purchase the how-to guide for $137 US if you're a fraudster and wanted to get around pay ID and do fraud. Um, Brett, sorry, just to butt in, we've got another question just relating to a previous slide. Um, yep. Can the fingerprints be used in an open bullet config? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know. I know um, so open bullet from, you know, from my memory is a web testing application, right? It's a being able to test your front door. I don't know directly if it can be used. Um, I, I'm assuming the use case would be to you know, if you downloaded something from Genesis, run it through a test through OpenBullet and see if it worked would be the use case. But um, I, I honestly don't know. I'd probably have to check, but I, I sort of get the premise of the question. Thank you. Um, and here's a, an example um, around uh, hacking ATMs. Now, ATMs are inherently pretty secure, particularly in, in our region, but there's a lot of those ATMs that aren't. Um, you know, personally, I avoid ATMs that aren't attached to a bank branch, you know, because the bank branch ones are generally the more secure ones because they're run by the banks. You know, those ones that you see in a 7-Eleven store or, you know, in a pub, I always be a little bit cautious of what um, may be there because there's generally not as heavy security around them. And like anything in security, if you can get physical access to something, direct access, there's generally some way of exploiting it. Uh, and so this this particular tool and how-to guide was about how to use, where to plug in different types of ATMs. There's even a, and I've redacted it here to protect the answers because some of the answers were quite sensitive, but you know, an FAQ. You know, well, what if someone's watching me or how do I get around this and what do I do this and what does this work on? You know, and this is a this is a particular actor who built something with a Raspberry Pi. Um, so not particularly, you know, advanced, just, you know, simple. <laughs> uh, like I mentioned earlier, plenty of uh, information about bank accounts, you know, credit card information for sale. You know, they, a lot of times they provide samples to prove the balances. And again, these do go up and down in price based on the balance and the type of accounts and if it's a high net worth individual, et cetera. So this is very much a, a prevalent um, thing. I mentioned that chat is becoming a big um, uptick um, for fraudsters in particular or generally threat actors in general. So there's a lot of frauding, carding, banking focused hacking um, type um, Telegram, QQ, WhatsApp uh, services, right? So you can see I, I grabbed some samples here. So these are everywhere where people are posting how-to videos to, hey, look at look at me, I'm I'm stealing money from this ATM, or I'm intercepting Bluetooth, and here's a tool set I use, or here's all my credit cards. So very big activity, lots and lots, you know, if not thousands, of uh, Telegram and QQ chat services, purely focused on um, monetization. My goodness, that's quite a lot for everyone to process. Um, look, we've had so much information. Are you able to distill like three main trends that we've seen in the first hard half of 2020? Yeah, no problems. So I think the first one we'll talk about is ransomware. In, in explicit, you know, I guess specifically uh, extortionist ransomware. And for those who haven't sort of been tracking, you know, I'll give you, that ransomware sort of goes in you know, phases, right? But what the first sort of phase of ransomware we saw a few years ago was literally a, you'd get a phishing email, you get a bad attachment, you'd click on it, you'd um, have your computer encrypted and they'd ask you for a Bitcoin on payment to unencrypt it, right? So it was very much a, a singular type process. In the last, you know, six to 12 months, you know, early 2020, we've seen a big uptick where they're now actually deploying some sort of malware stealing some data first, getting you know, the data, and then doing the ransom and locking it, and then offering an extortionist type scenario, if you don't pay, we will publish. And I'm not gonna name and shame you know, entities, but you can easily track any, a lot of the publicly based cyber um, breaches or attacks or ransomware attacks that's happened in the first half of 2020 to this exact scenario where someone's gone in, stolen information, locked it down with ransom, and then basically said, if you don't pay up, um, will extort it and publish it. And they do, they generally follow through because going back to my original scenarios, this is about trust. You know, if they don't follow through, 
they're not a trustworthy, all right? Plenty of families of ransomware out there. Um, Maze is probably the, the one that sort of started the trend and probably the most um, one that most people recognize. But we're, we're I think, tracking, um, you know, there's like at least 10, 15 families of these ransomwares and they all have different motivations. But you know, just suffice to say, it's a, there's one every day, right? But there's interesting there, there's sort of two trends we've seen in the ransomware space and there's two sort of vectors. So the first one, um, a Rukot or Rukot attack, I can never say it right, but um, Rukot attack is essentially essentially one actor group. They don't share, they're on their own mission, be that financial motivated or, or espionage motivated or you know, stealing IP. It's one threat actor group. And this is sort of the traditional sort of malware uh, attack that we see, right? So they, they'll get you through phishing. They generally are de deploying a piece of malware called Emotet. Emotet then gets onto the computer and will then generally deploy TrickBot, which is another ransom. The, the main things with these, they're, they're modular malware. They're very small. They're updating all the time and they only pull down modules they need. And this is where they'll start to you know, do what's called persistence. So stay on your network, move around, stay hidden, get RDP access, use a technology or a, a technique called Mimikatz, um, which steals passwords off Active Directory. And they, they stay there and for a while. And at some point, if once they've sort of got what they needed, they might then go and deploy ransomware, right? Or generally do deploy ransomware. And they do that through, you know, sometimes through your, through your SCCM, if you're using Microsoft, say, deployment tools, scripting, PS exec, various different. And I think the interesting trend we've been seeing too is a lot of the, what we call dwell time. So the time when they're in there doing Emotet to when the actual ransomware happens has is essentially um, you know, months, days to months, right? It's not It's not hours. And of course, a lot of the other ransomware families is what I've been talking about, ransomware as a service. Purely, you go and buy it, you use it, you do your own campaign and you move on with your life. So, uh, and that's open to everybody and it's sort of um, all monetary focused. Like everything, they offer how-to documents. They make sure that you can get, they sort of live by their word, right? They wanna make sure that they've got good reputation. So they tell you how to decrypt. They even give you a test. So if you um, wanted to test that their decryptor tool works, they'll, sh you know, they'll show you how to do that. They'll give you guarantees and they're very much about reputation, proving that they are good with what they say. If, if you pay them, they will give you your data back. Now, I'm not going to get into the argument of paying or not paying ransomware. That's a conversation for another time. But, you know, suffice to say, many of these actors will, will get you at least to a point where you can um, pay it. Uh, they advertise, they love the media. We, obviously everyone talks about them. Maze you know, was well known for this press release back in March where they essentially were talking about why they do things. It's all, you know, it's all very good things. Oh, we trying to disrupt the establishment. We want to, you know, help people. It's all this sort of, you know, it sounds great, right? But reality is they're, they're just trying to destroy your business, right? And disrupt you because that's ransomware is designed to do. It's purely a destructive style of attack. And, of you know protecting the innocent here, but we you know on a daily basis we're tracking that extortionist publicizing advertising type scenario. The people who haven't paid, we've been you know they will then get their data publicized for download um, up on the various different ransomware blogs uh, and sites that these uh, actors work on. So it's quite it's almost on a daily basis that these go up, and you can sort of see just from you know when we started tracking some of these basic ransomware ones from early February to now, it's uh, it's, it's grown considerably. They do have a conscience in some respects, and um, this was reported, uh, I think, in Bleeding Computer back in uh, the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where they were sort of saying, oh, look, you know, we're all, we're all good. We don't want to uh, go out and attack um, the medical industry. We, you know, we, we don't want to attack the healthcare sector because they, they're, they're under the pump at the moment because something else. But we'll go attack everybody else, just not the healthcare sector. And of course, you know, we want to make sure um, we're good, right? But not necessarily true, but I guess it was a gesture. And more recently, um, again, this is very much um, an evolving space. So there's always new pieces of ransomware coming out. This is an example of um, a threat actor in a Russian forum advertising a new piece of ransomware. You know, like anything, they advertise the features, et cetera. All right, so it's pretty deliberate. I touched on COVID-19. I, I don't think a 2020 webinar would be a 2020 webinar without a mention of COVID-19 that we're all living <laughs> in. Um, but just quickly, just some of the things we've seen, um, and most people hopefully on the call are sort of familiar with this, but like anything, opportunity is there. Um, they attack based on opportunity. So naturally, anything to do with COVID was, it was up for grabs. Everything from, you know, 
misinformation to finding medical research, stealing patient data, doing malware, you know, physical crime, you know, fraud, stealing stuff from retailers, all that stuff just became open slaver as it always does in a pandemic when everyone's looking at something else, you distract them by doing other things. So uh, um, not unusual. Uh, in the early days, in back in March, big uptick in the whole um, fake drugs, the cure for coronavirus, uh, you know, how to uh, get the vaccine. Uh, clearly, all this is, uh, is not, is all counterfeit or wrong or fake. It's purely a money grabbing thing because, um, you know, we all know at the moment there is no vaccine. So it's, it's just that within days of this coming worldwide, um, people taking advantage. Uh, same thing when we started doing the panic buying. You know, everyone knew that everyone wanted a mask, everyone wanted hand sanitizers. Naturally, um, they became a big topic for sale on a lot of the underground forums, right, and at really bad prices. And, of course, counterfeited. You know, we saw lots of fake, well, not fake masks, masks that were real but weren't really medical certified, right, so you're just getting an inferior product. I guess more disturbingly, it's the... Um, it is this misinformation when it comes to this one's around um, antibody detection tests, fake tests, um, you know, being able to sell them at bulk, you know, and, and there's always going to be an underground black market for any of these type of um, uh, items, in, particularly in a pandemic, right, that we've never had before. But um, like I said, this is just the usual opportunist type scenario. Um, you know, from a physical perspective, like I mentioned, one of the, you know, if you're a retailer, um, there's how-to documents and this particular chap on a forum was like how to exploit the COVID-19 by, you know, getting refunds and, you know, and there's obviously a trend where if you bought something like a physical device online or, you know, and you, and you claim you had COVID, the, a lot of times the retailer didn't want the device back, so, you know, get a bonus one type thing. So there's all these Scams is just one example that was from early this month, actually. Um, but lots of scams on how to take advantage of businesses during hard times, right? And this is just um, you know, opportunist type <laughs> activity. On the, on the topic of cyber, um, I think we did, everyone saw a massive uptick in scam emails, but this was just the usual, you know what, well, let's go and target whatever the topic of the day is. You know, you'll see an uptick in, um, Christmas style phishing campaigns around the holiday season. You see an uptick around tax fraud scams around the tax season. Clearly COVID was no different. There was hundreds and hundreds of them. There's, here's an example of a post that was on one of the forums where you can literally go and download out of the box scam campaigns related to COVID. Um, I thought it was quite interesting. There was a, you know, a lot of, in cyber particularly, there's a lot of talk about all, all this malware and what have you. And I really found an article quite interesting from Microsoft earlier this month uh, late last month around the fact that, look, there was an uptick a little bit. And if you look down the very bottom graph, the, the orange one, you know, early March, there was a slight uptick in the amount of malware going out. But the top one, which is the normal <laughs> sort of trends of malware, hasn't changed, right? So reality is, um, you know, essentially um, the ability to, uh, you know, take advantage. I'm just going to move really quickly through some of this stuff now because I know we're going to be short on time. Um, Taking advantage, hacking healthcare systems, hacking healthcare websites, stealing personal data, right? This is something we see considerably, you know, personal identifiable information, test results. You know, this is a recent one from June, unfortunately, of some couple of individuals who had their, their personal identifiable information, including scan results um, uh, published online, which is obviously a, a breach of privacy. So like anything, taking advantage of those, those systems. And sort of just to wrap up on one of the final trends is stolen credentials. I touched on this earlier around brute forcing and uh, attacking of Citrix and RDP. A lot of that is done because people's credentials are being stolen, right? And what this really means is credentials can be stolen from a number of areas. They can be scammed off a website. They can be stolen from an attack of a website. Uh, you could get malware installed on your computer. You could be a full victim to a very sophisticated phishing campaign that prompts you to enter your credentials in. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and there's a general cycle that goes around in, in the criminal community, right? The data gets collected, you know, it gets put into some sort of what we call combo lists. So you, the more data you have, the more valuable it is. So you tend to pull a lot of these data into what's called a combo list so you can sell it in bulk. They get run through account checkers to make sure they're active and usable and they haven't expired and, you know, the usual thing to make sure the data is valuable and they get put up onto the um, count shops for purchase. Um, and 
you know, brute force attacks are then used to uh, essentially attack the uh, the individual, right? So here's some examples of where I can go and download automatic account checkers and validation systems using proxy servers and essentially test those credentials before I launch an attack and try and get into a, um, a particular entity. Just to put it into context from an Australian perspective, um, you know, our um, Office of Australian Information Commissioner releases a half yearly uh, notifiable, notifiable breach report. And this is from uh, the last one, which is July to December, 2019. You can see that you know all the breaches that they tracked, 68% had something to do with compromised credentials, either via phishing, via malware, or a brute force attack, right? So that's quite high. You know, that means that a lot of the breaches that we're seeing, in, particularly in Australia, that were, were notified were because of a stolen credential. Right, and that was just used. Sometimes it's very targeted, they are, you know, or it can. Sometimes it's just luck, brute forcing, you know, using what we call dictionary attacks, those type of things, just to get in. Uh, one of the more public one of these that's now come out um, back. You may remember back in 2018, one of our um, shipbuilders um, was breached, and that data was then put up online, in, uh, up on uh, forums for sale, uh, and. Just earlier this year, this, uh, that company came out and after that sort of the breach investigation was done, it was determined it was a stolen credential sold on the dark web, right? That's what got through the through that breach. So, my goodness. Yeah. So, I'm um, just in the interest of time. I know that there was one more question, but I'm afraid we're about to be cut off. So, um, look. Thank you so much for going through everything, demystifying the illicit uh, web world. And I think it's safe to say that we, if we're going to be managing our cyber risk, we need to actually have a look at an outward facing risk intelligence piece as well. Look, for anyone wanting more information, please feel free to contact us at support at vcyber.com.au. And if we haven't been able to answer your questions, once again, sorry, but please feel free to send them through to that email and I will make sure that they are answered. Thank you very much. So everyone, be safe and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.